Okay, we're on. Hey, good evening. I'm Fred R. Carey. I'm 55 years old. Born and raised in Utica, New York. Currently president living in Sequoia, New York, a small hamlet just south of the city. I'm here in the home of uh, John Faba, and he's recording me tonight because I'm here to tell you a story. A story of an encounter that happened to me on July 24th, 1991. I decided to uh, come out, tell the story to whoever might be interested in hearing it. It's been told to a few people during my lifetime, not many but a few, and now I'm going to share this story with uh, whoever else is willing to listen. So it's a, it's a story of, a, of an evening uh, of fishing with a close friend of mine, and this took place in a little hamlet called Hubbardsville, New York, uh, probably a 30, 35 minute ride south of, uh, of my house, and it's a, it's a small uh, waterway that connects to a series of reservoirs in, a, in an area in central New York known as the Nine Mile Swamp Area. Uh, Nine Mile Swamp Area is probably uh, most uh, famous for some of the stories of the old Loomis gang back in the in the early days of our, our settlers. <laughs> People might know of central New York or certainly know of, or heard of those stories, but this is the this is the area of which I'm speaking. Um, it's close to uh, to uh, Hamilton, New York, which is the home of uh, Colgate University, if you want to better pinpoint where this is. But uh, it's a very picturesque, uh, nice waterway. It's mostly a canoeist, uh, kayaking type of a waterway that does hold a decent population of fish. So this was a beautiful, beautiful, typical uh, mid-July summer night. It kind of night where it's that first beautiful hot weather you get when you really know it's summertime now and it's, you know, it's time to get out there and enjoy the outdoors and that's what we did. We, we, we took off for an evening after work and went, out, went traveled down south to get a couple hours worth of fishing in and enjoy the evening. So you know, there was nothing unusual about the night, it was great, you know, it's a, it's a paddle, paddling adventure and we, you know, we, from where we put in at the, the country road at the side of the bridge we probably would travel upstream a couple miles, I would, at least a couple miles upstream, and then we would pretty much float down with the current and fish along the way. Uh, it's not big water in, in most air, uh, sections of this, uh, this waterway. It's really not much wider than a typical room in your house. It's very flat, flat black water, yet it is moving water. Uh, there's no swift currents that you you encounter. It's pretty pretty much flat water, very calm. Uh, you are lower on the water level than you are on the side of the banks. It's pretty much overgrown, so you're sitting pretty much low, and you don't get to see across any distances of the field or swamp. You're pretty much hung down in there. Well, it was just a typical night. I can't brag about any great fish we caught, but uh, as it was getting uh, towards the End of the evening, sun setting, and we had ways to get back. Uh, once we decided to uh, call it a night and say, okay, we're pretty much done fishing, uh, I had an odd experience. I looked down next to me in my canoe, and uh, my paddle, my paddle that I have, I'm in the back of the canoe, I'm, uh, I'm the stair, the main paddler, my paddle uh, was no longer in the canoe. Uh, fishing poles, tackle box, they were there. My friend's uh, paddle, he had the paddle in the front, but my paddle wasn't there. And I don't remember dropping it in the water. I could have, I guess, but you know, I would thought I would have hurt it. So I asked uh, my friend for the for the paddle, and so I could have it because I have to paddle from the back with one paddle, not him from the front. And uh, I started looking around for the for the paddle. I mean, it's gonna float, it's not very wide, 10, 12 feet wide, it couldn't have gone too far. Uh, so as we went back down the stream a little bit and I looked for it and it was nowhere to be seen. I actually turned around and paddled back up to the, to the point where we quit fishing 
to make sure it wasn't hung up in the branches or under the undercover or something. It was just odd that the paddle had just disappeared with no explanation. Uh, when it should, if it's laying on the floor of the canoe, it certainly should have just got up and jumped overboard, but it wasn't there. So that's it. I'm done looking for the paddle. I can't explain where it went, so I'm just going to, you know, call it a day and I lost my paddle. And I'm going to paddle out on my own and that's what I proceeded to do and it was just like I said it was a gorgeous evening I'm just standing up and I'm paddling the canoe from the back nice and slow as we meander a lot of switchbacks and, and runs to this uh, slow flat water and I, you know probably about the after about first five minutes uh, of paddling as I'm standing up you know I, I'm at a view where I could see a little bit higher now since I'm standing I can see to the top of the grasses along the bank and I'm, I'm looking and I can see in a distance I could see that there was a, a an area a glowing area in the distance where it was lit up and I was like we we're quite a distance from where we had to be yet but it was kind of odd because I was like I don't remember anything over there what's what's you know a house or, or a building or not anywhere as close to the village, but it was so bright, this, this, this glowing light. And it was meant nothing to me at the time, and I just, we just kept going, you know, and as we meandered down this section, we were meandering on the next section, the, 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 the glow in the distance was always off in front of me to my left, it, it was still in the same area. Well, as we got closer to the, there's a, a big wide run as the, as the river narrows up, it gets to a wider section. There's this last big straight run, probably about 200 yards. It makes a sharp 90 degree turn to the left and carries on for probably another 100 yards until it comes to a, a narrow gauntlet. And at that point in time, there's an old beaver dam that you have to negotiate. That when you came up from where we launched the canoe, we would, we would paddle up against the swift current. We would hit this old beaver dam and we have to get out, just jump over the old beaver dam, get into the flat water and carry on. And of course we have to reverse this on the way back. So as we hit this last straightaway, this 200 yard straightaway, I'm, I'm, now I realize exactly where I am, how close I am to, to our destination. And I could tell that the, that the lighting isn't back at the, say the bridge, or it's, it's, it's in an area where I didn't, there shouldn't be any lighting. You know, I'm just saying to myself, oh, it must be, you know, people fishing on the bank, probably, you know, they're combing lanterns or whatever, and it's no big deal. You know. So as we, you know, I'm talking with my friend and just enjoying the evening, we're paddling, you know, we get to the, we get to the point where the, we have to make the curve and hit that last stretch. And when I came around the curve, <clears throat> made that last stretch, and I'm looking straight on to the source of the lights and uh, the source of the lights was not on the bank or on the water's edge the source of the lights was set back into the woods and uh, at a hundred yards it was it, it clearly looked odd to me it, it was clearly something there a, a, a piece of equipment uh, a machine an object something fairly large but it certainly wasn't fishermen along the bank fishing. Okay, what is this? I don't know. But we're going to find out because we're drifting and slowly paddling closer to it. I would say probably at 75 yards out, I can clearly tell this was a, a, a conical shaped object. Why was it conical? Because I could clearly see the the, the the, the sides of it, the cutoff top, the bottom. It was conical, it was curved because on the right hand side, my view looking straight at it on the right hand side, it had three stationary lights lit up. I would call them bars, strips, bars. One, two, three. Clearly defining the curve of the object. They were amber in color. Amber as in the same exact color that you find on your car in your driveway, your signal light. And they were just lit up. The machine was whitish, glowing. The forest floor 
all around it had a aura of a of a fog, a haze, uh, something that you would see maybe as a special effect that would occur with uh, uh, dry ice, the evaporation of, of the CO2, but yet it was no movement to it. It was just this white, foggy aura over the, the earth. At 50 yards, I can clearly see two, two entities, I would call them, because I, for better lack of what it was, I don't know, but it was two, not one, two, two figurines that were hiding behind the, the machine, I'll call it a machine. Um, They were hiding because they were clearly looking out the side, veering out the side, taking a peek and watching us. They were watching us because at 50 yards I had started to communicate. My curiosity was, what is this? What am I looking at here? So I yelled out to them. How's it going tonight? How you doing? Nothing. Dead silent. It was so dead silent that I didn't hear a cricket. I didn't hear a frog. I didn't hear anything. The whole environment around us is dead, silent, calm. Warm, muggy evening. The two figurines, as I yelled out to them, at that point in time of parrying behind the machine, they made a quick duck behind the machine to hide. Okay, I don't know what this is going on. I don't even know what I'm looking at. This is odd, and it was odd. What is this machine? What is it doing there? What did I just witness? I just witnessed two figurines, pale white, with dark black shiny eyes. They were larger than mine is the most identifying feature I can make of what I just witnessed. My friend sitting in front of me is witnessing this exact same thing. From 100 yards to the 50 yard event, I had been communicating with my friend. And all the way I kept asking him, what is this, Lou? What the hell is this, Lou? I badgered this poor guy so much that he snapped back at me. He said, he said, I don't know what it is. Shut up. He was nervous of what we, were, what we were watching. As we got closer, now I'm within 30, 30 yards. The current is taking me towards this uh, beaver dam. I'm no longer paddling. There's no need to paddle. My eyes are focused on something. I can't make out what it is. And once again, the land is aglow. The machine is sitting there. I would I would say it's about um, eight to nine foot tall. It uh, clearly stood on at least three legs that I could tell. It had an additional feature to it. It had a, a light. I call it a light. It had an object on top of it on the left hand side as I'm looking at it, it would be on the top left. During my shout out to whatever it is I'm shouting out to with no reply, at, at a certain point in time, I couldn't tell you if it was 50 yards, I'll say 50 yards, it was a, a little bit of a distance. After the figurines had ducked back in to hide, this object on top of the machine, I'll call it, it made, made a complete about a 180 and turned around nice and slow and was shining right at us, which appeared to me look like a typical spotlight, a floodlight of some sort. Only problem was it was shining right at us, this round, white light source 
but there is no light shining on our canoe, our bodies, on the water. I don't know how, but we were not lit up with this light shining on us. This did raise a few hackles on our neck, I guess. This is not natural for this type of thing to happen. Um, I'm curious, but I'm also respectful not to, you know, butt in where I don't belong. Uh, I'm assuming whatever's going on, maybe I don't need to know. Maybe it's none of my business. Uh, am I seeing something beyond my comprehension? What's on this earth? Is this a... Uh, uh, this entity is not human? Is this machine nothing like I've ever seen in my life? What is it? I have no clue. Yet there it is, right in front of me. Big as day. Dead silent. No communication. As we drift closer, now we, we can't be 30 yards from this, this machine in the woods. The canoe makes its way through the current and finally lands on top of the the washed out beaver dam uh, at that point in time you know we actually literally have to get out of the canoe just kind of drag it over a little bit so we can carry on at that point in time before we did this now I'm standing there get you know we just stuck there for a while just looking at it and uh, standing right there just came out of nowhere standing right there at 15 feet across from me to where the water is to where the bank is is now standing there, one of those entities that we, that we saw earlier, standing right there, 15 feet from me. Looks like a figurine. No identifiable clothes, no identifiable anything. It looks like a figurine. I only describe it as an artist's uh, model doll that they use when they pose and they draw with this smooth, normal shaped figurine this is exactly what it looked like at 15 feet i should have been able to make great detail up close of what it was unfortunately we're in pitch black darkness the light source of the machine the glowing light is 30 yards back the figurine is half that distance it's 15 feet right in front of me yet it's facing me and what i'm seeing is the dark side of it much like you would be at a, at a campfire, sitting around with your friends, you could all see each other's faces. But if you were to get up and turn and face away from the fire to, to, to talk to an incoming, incoming friend, they probably wouldn't see your face or be able to make out who you were because you are now black. You, there's no light shining on you. This unfortunately was the situation for me. It was right there, 15 feet away, yet I'm looking at just its outline against the light backdrop and it's just this figurine shape. No identifiable clothes, no hats, no short sleeve shirt sleeves, no pants that I could tell, a smooth, very defined figurine. The figurine made an attempt to communicate with us at this time. John would like to stop the camera for a minute, I'll get up and I will show you exactly what it did. Okay, so during this peculiarity, as I'll call it, uh, I'm a mechanic by trade. I'm a, I'm a tradesman, worked in all types of equipment. I can't tell you I've ever seen anything that quite looked like this object, this machine. Uh, nothing that I know of in the world uh, I've ever seen anything like it or what it could have possibly been used for, other than it was a conical shaped machine of some sort. Back to our friends, our figuring entities who, uh, who were hiding from us, who showed apprehension, I would say, I would call it, uh, who didn't reply to us like a human being would, who wouldn't shout, who wouldn't shout back if you're only 30 yards away as I'm yelling out to you. I'm just a fisherman in a canoe with a friend fishing and you could be anybody in the woods at a campsite or whatever it is you're doing. Uh, perhaps you were doing something you shouldn't have been doing. I couldn't tell you anything, anything that was going on. My story is, is I think, is, has much more 
going on than that. But at that point in time, we had reached that beaver dam and we were stuck there and we had to get out and, and leave. Uh, I'm looking at an angle. I'm standing here in a canoe and I'm looking back at an angle. And this figurine is standing right there, not 15 feet from me. So all that's separating me is the water that I'm, I'm on, 15 feet of water to that bank. And it's looking right at me. And of course, like I told you, it is pitch black out. And so all I could see is its perfect figurine outline against the lit background of the machine that it's, it's behind it. Well, this is what the figurine did to me and my friend. And I take this as a form of communication, I would say. You could see its arm, if you'll call it an arm, okay, it's an appendage. You can clearly tell it had a flat, sleek hand, probably had a thumb, you see the V here. It didn't wave, it didn't do anything like this, but its arm was perpendicular to its torso, very square-like, perpendicular, just like this. And this is what it did. In this very slow motion, form of a wave, I guess. And its wrist was very articulated, just like you see what I'm doing with mine. Just like this. That was too much at that point in time for my friend to handle, I think. He, um, need I say, got nervous and uh, this was a very odd experience, as you could tell by the story. At that point in time, he had already jumped out of the canoe, yanked it from out from underneath me. I was literally, almost fell into the water. I had the paddle to stop me from going face first into the, into the creek. I grabbed the hold of the canoe and yelled at him, probably with some choice words to stop and wait a damn minute. And at that time I had looked back at my figurine friend here who was no, no longer waving. He was just standing there at a very statuesque pose, doing nothing. I never felt I was in any kind of danger. I never felt that I was in trouble here. My curiosity overcame all these things. But yet, something told me to get the hell out of Dodge with my friend and leave. Which is what we did. Jumped in the canoe, took off, made a quick 200 yard run down the rest of the creek. Pulled the canoe out fast, threw it in the back of the pickup, tied it up, beat feet. Just a short drive down a country road, go across a railroad track to get up to the highway. I kind of felt silly, really, at that point in time. I was like, well, what do you think we saw? You know, or you second guess everything you're seeing. I said, what, 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 are we, what are we, like little children? What do we think we saw? Do we really think we saw what we think we saw? I mean, was, it, was that really what it was that we saw? Did we really see whatever? Uh, an unidentified object on the ground? With, with maybe an alien entities along with it? Is this what we really saw? I have no clue. I have no clue. So all I know is my friend was very nervous, shook up. First thing that came out of his mouth was we gotta call somebody. We gotta call the authorities. We gotta call whoever. So we're not gonna call anybody because if this phenomenon is taking place on this planet, it, we're not the first ones to have seen it, obviously. And the authorities did to be certainly know what's going on. Who am I to rough anybody's feathers? Who am I to come out and say this in this fantastic story? I think I'll just leave it alone. I said, shut up, we're not gonna tell anybody anything. We went another mile or two down the road, I changed my mind. Matter of fact, I pleaded with him, turn around, let's go back. Let's go back. 
I said, let's turn around, go back right now. Let's go, let's go see what this was. Let's park the truck. Let's walk right back in the woods. Let's take our chances that we're butting in. We don't, we don't belong. What's the worst that can happen? We get, a, we confront somebody. We get yelled at. Let's go get it off our chest. Go see what this was. It didn't happen. I wasn't driving that night. My friend was. He was shook up. We're going home. And home we went. I think I'll sit down for the rest of the rest oh, okay. of the, the, that's good, that's the great. story. Okay. Well, the ride home was uh, was probably interesting. It's been a long time now. I'm, I'm sure that's all we did was rehash everything we saw. Uh, you know what happened to the paddle. Uh, you know why didn't the light shine on us? Uh, what the hell were these figurines? Uh, what was this machine? Why was this earth, this foggy glowing aura uh, coming up from the earth? I mean, it didn't look like the light was shining down. It looked like there was lights on the ground shining up in the pitch black darkness, stuck amongst a set of trees, fully grown trees, in the third week of July, in a forest in full bloom. Um, I have no clue. We went home, we went to bed, we slept on it. We went to work the next day. We went to work the following day. The third day was a Saturday. We um, I normally worked on a Saturday and at least a half a day, I didn't that day. Uh, my friend and I put the canoe back in the pickup truck and we went back to the creek. Hell, we'll go fishing again, right? Why not? Let's let's go take let's go take a look. Let's go over in the morning. Let's go fishing and let's go take a look in the woods. You know where this happened. And try to make sense of all this in our head. You know what what went on. So that's what we did. Not particularly early. Whatever. It was probably nine o'clock in the morning. Doesn't matter. Here we got in. It was another beautiful July, sunny July morning. It was great. You know, perfect summer weather. Nice day to be outside. And we uh, met our run, got our canoe, had another paddle to use that day. <laughs> and we paddled up, hit the, hit the beaver dam, got out. We, naturally, we would take off, go down the river. We need not. So all we had to do was just go another 20 feet, beach the canoe, get out. Walk in the woods. We did just that. I don't think we walked uh, 30 feet, perhaps. Now, I keep in mind here, this is July 27th now, I believe, if I'm right. It's peak of summer. Vegetation is growing everywhere. Grass is tall in the forest. Uh, what do you see in a forest? You see oh, whatever's growing there, you know, whether it's a uh, native uh, weed species, uh, sapling trees, standing amongst a uh, fully mature 18 to 20 inch diameter maples or ash, beech, whatever these trees are that we're standing amongst. This is a section of nine mile swamp, this area, in central New York. You get the picture. We're in full bloom here. Most plants, uh, ground plants growing up are at least the uh, three quarters of the mature height before they go to seed in, the, in late summer and fall. So vegetation is everywhere, like it should be. So you understand now, we're, we're in a lush green forest. Everything's green, everything's growing, it's beautiful. Well, we're 35, 35 feet from the water's edge into where we, we had saw this machine and our entity friends. And what I saw next astonished me. Because in this area where this took place, and I'm going to guesstimate it was at least a 30 foot diameter area, I could not tell you if it was perfectly round. I'd have to be up in the sky looking down at the ground to tell you that. But I can tell you there was several mature uh, 20 inch diameter 
trees, fully grown trees, 40, 50 feet in the sky. They were in, the, in this area and what we saw was unexplainable. What we saw was the earth was stripped bare. It was stripped bare of everything. There wasn't a single leaf. There wasn't a single blade of grass. We put our hands in the dirt. It picked, we could pick it up and it was almost like powder. It was as if it was sifted through a screen 10,000 times. There wasn't a single stone, not a single chip of gravel, not a tiniest piece. If you were to pull up a, a, a weed out of the ground and look at the roots, you'll see all the little fine hair roots that go, are attached to the main roots. There was nothing, not a single piece of organic material left in this earth, in this whole entire area. All of the major trees were standing there. They were precision, the bark of the tree, where the bark of the tree met the ground all the way around its circumference was surgical. Bark, dirt, bark, dirt. Not a piece of lichen mold, not a piece of moss. There was not a single animal track, not a bird track, not a rabbit track, not a deer track, not a raccoon track. There were no tracks. There were no prints of what was there standing there three nights earlier. There was no indentations in the ground of where this machine was standing. They were stripped bare. There were three tiny lumps in the ground in a straight line that didn't come up off the forest floor 10 inches, I would say. I dug down with my hands into one of them. What I was looking for, I don't know. I dug and I dug into the ground. The ground was so loose. I'm a gardener, one of my hobbies. I have a rear time tiller. When I till my garden, it's usually three passes until I get that earth so, so deep, about this deep loamy, where you can stick your hands right into it. This is what a good gardener does with a good, good tiller. This was exactly like that. I could stick my hands right into the forest floor. Stick it right into the dirt deep, loose dirt. We walked around the perimeter, we checked everything. Once again, there were no tracks. No animals had stepped onto this pure forest floor. We're the first ones stepping on it. On it. I walked all the way around the perimeter and everywhere around there's tall grass. I'm six foot one. This grass is up to my chest. There was not a footpath. There was not a deer trail, any animal paths, nothing leading to this. There were no wheel marks. There was no drag marks. On the far corner from the water to the bare dirt to the far corner deeper into the woods, I walked through the high grass till I came to the corner of a farmer's cornfield with standing corn. Once again, there could have been access from that cornfield to this water's edge to bring this piece of equipment in. All the grasses, all the weeds, and all the vegetation standing tall, nothing has been disturbed. Once again, nothing has been disturbed. This eight to nine foot tall conical shaped machine was standing there just three nights earlier. How did it get there? There is no evidence whatsoever that indicates this machine was on, was, was on wheels or a track, dragged in, carried in, nothing. We're in a pristine part of a summertime forest, undisturbed, except for this area that we're standing in where the earth is completely stripped bare. I can't I can't emphasize enough. It is completely stripped bare. Once again, all the, everywhere we're looking in this whole area, you could put your hand anywhere and pick it up and it's like nothing. Clean, sifted, beautiful, brown, organic dirt with not a single stone, 
Not a single root, nothing. Stripped bare. And, and amongst this area is at least a half a dozen full size, fully grown trees standing there with bark that meets bare dirt. What did we see? What machine could have done this? I don't know. I'm not sharing the story to tell you that I saw aliens or I saw an alien craft. I might have. That might have been exactly what I saw. So all I know is whatever it was, they removed what was once there. They took the earth. They took the vegetation. They removed it because all that's left now is bare earth. I don't know anybody that could do this in, in three days. I, I mean, certainly if it would take a team of people to go on there and dig up the, dig up the earth, dig up the, dig up the dirt, keep putting it through screens, get every last little piece of stone out of there and piece of vegetation. It was so sterile. It's beyond description. To see it with your own eyes, you'd have to, you could, I, I'm probably not even doing justice telling you how sterile it was. I'm trying to articulate as much as I can to, to, to you, you put yourself there. There, once again, there was no evidence of, of this machine being brought into this site. I wish I didn't let my friend scare us off and leave that evening. I wish we did stick our nose in where it didn't belong. I wish we did go, go talk to and see the entity friend who was waving at us. I would like to know to this day exactly what it was I saw that night and have an answer. I'm afraid I'm probably in my lifetime I'm never going to. Uh, the man that's filming this right now is also a witness to this event. Uh, naturally, I, I told some people when I when I you know when we came back it was sensational. I told uh, one of my best friends, my cousin, you know the story, and they you know what do most people think when they hear stories like this? Is it true? Just another just another crackpot telling some crazy story. Ha ha ha. Whatever. Take it for what you will. I'm telling you exactly what I saw, exactly what happened. This is, this is a true story of my encounter, my experience that happened in the summer of 1991, July 24th. Uh, my cousin told a friend of his and they came down to my place of business, uh, probably that following uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of that following week. I don't know which day it was. And uh, they wanted to hear the story themselves. You know, tell us all about it. Go through the whole thing again. And we did, just like I, I'm telling you right now. And I told them, I said, you could, you could go down and I'll tell you exactly where this was, how to get there, where to park, where to walk. Go see the bare earth yourself. They did. And the fellow that's filming me right now could validate this part of the story because he was also an eyewitness to the stripped bare earth in the middle of the summer forest. Uh, what was it we saw? Don't know. I would like to know. I believe there's probably somebody out there that does know. Uh, I'm a 55 year old man. I've seen a lot in my life. I'm not afraid to tell the story. I'm not afraid of who, who listens to the story. I think it's, it was time to get this out and get it, you know, get it off my chest, whatever. To whoever studies this type of phenomenon and may be interested in hearing it, if it's some kind of a help, this is why I'm taking the time to just repeat the story. Uh, there's no monetary gain I'm looking for. I'm doing this as a request uh, by the man standing behind his camera who is interested in this type of stuff, who once again witnessed the earth himself five or six days after this event. Uh, and that's really about all there is to it. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a fascinating story. I, I, I never forget it. 
I made a mistake not, uh, <laughs> probably made a mistake or maybe I was lucky I, I didn't, who <laughs> knows, I'll never know. But uh, you know, human nature, my human nature is, you know, you mind your own business, right? I, 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 I yelled out, I spoke out, I tried to get their attention, they never replied to me. I don't know any humans that don't reply to people like that in close, close proximity. It is what it is. You know, it's, a, it's something I'll never forget and that's 100% true. What was it that I saw? I do not know. What did I saw? I do know. And that's the story I just shared with you. Thank you. Thank you, Freddie you get when you really know it's summertime now and it's, you know it's time to get out there and enjoy the outdoors and that's what we did we we, we took off for an evening after work and when not went traveled down south to get a couple hours worth of fishing in and enjoy the evening so you know there's nothing unusual about the night it was great you know it's a it's a paddle paddling adventure and we you know we, from where we put in at the the country road at the side of the bridge we probably would travel upstream couple miles, I would, at least a couple miles upstream, and then we would pretty much float down with the current and fish along the way. Uh, it's not big water in, in most air, uh, sections of this, uh, this waterway. It's really not much wider than a typical room in your house. It's very flat, flat black water, yet it is moving water. Uh, there's no swift currents that you, you encounter. It's pretty, pretty much flat water, very calm. Uh, you are lower on the water level than you are on the side of the banks. It's pretty much overgrown. So you're sitting pretty much low and you don't get the sense. I have to paddle from the back with one paddle, not him from the front. And uh, I started looking around for the, for the paddle. I mean, it's gonna float. It's not very wide, 10, 12 feet wide. It couldn't have gone too far. Uh, so as we went back down the stream a little bit and I looked for it and it was nowhere to be seen. I actually turns around and paddled back up to the to the point where we quit fishing to make sure it wasn't hung up in the branches or under the undercover or something. It was just odd that the paddle had just disappeared with no explanation. Uh, when it should if it's laying on the floor of the canoe, it certainly shouldn't have just got up and jumped overboard, but it wasn't there. So that's it. I'm done looking for the paddle. I can't explain where it went, so I'm just gonna, you know, call it a day and I lost my paddle and I'm gonna paddle out on my own and that's what I proceeded to do. And it was just, like I said, it was a gorgeous evening. I'm just standing up and I'm paddling the canoe from the back nice and slow as we meander. A lot of switchbacks and, and runs to this. Uh... Okay, we're on. Hey, good evening. I'm Fred Arcuri, I'm 55 years old. Born and raised in Utica, New York. Currently, president living in Sequoia, New York, a small hamlet just south of the city. I'm here in the home of uh, John Faba, and he's recording me tonight because I'm here to tell you a story. A story of an encounter that happened to me on July 24th, 1991. I decided to uh, come out, tell the story to whoever might be interested in hearing it. It's been told to a few people during my lifetime, not many but a few, and I'm gonna share this story with uh, whoever else is willing to listen. So it's a, it's a story of, a, of an evening uh, of fishing with a close friend of mine. And this took place in a little hamlet called Hubbardsville, New York. Uh, probably a 30, 35 minute ride south of, uh, of my house. And it's a, it's a small, uh, waterway that connects to a series of reservoirs in, a, in an area in central New York known as the Nine Mile Swamp Area. Uh, Nine Mile Swamp Area is probably uh, most uh, famous for some of the stories of the old Loomis gang back in the in the early days of our, our settlers. <laughs> People might know of New, central New York or certainly know of, or heard of those stories, but this is the this is the area of which I'm speaking. Um, it's close to uh, to uh, Hamilton, New York, which is the home of uh, Colgate University, if you want to better pinpoint where this is. But uh, 
it's a very picturesque, uh, nice waterway. It's mostly a canoeist, uh, kayaking type of a waterway that does hold a decent population of fish. So this was a beautiful, beautiful, typical uh, mid-July summer night. It kind of night where it's that first beautiful hot weather you see across any distances of the field or swamp. You're pretty much hung down in there. Well, it was just a typical night. I can't brag about any great fish we caught, but uh, as it was getting uh, towards the end of the evening, sun setting, and we had ways to get back, uh, once we decided to uh, call it a night and say, okay, we're pretty much done fishing, uh, I had an odd experience. I looked down next to me in my canoe and uh, my paddle, my paddle that I have, I'm in the back of the canoe, I'm, uh, I'm the stair, the main paddler, my paddle uh, was no longer in the canoe. Uh, fishing poles, tackle box, they were there. My friend's uh, paddle, he had the paddle in the front, but my paddle wasn't there. And I don't remember dropping it in the water. I could have, I guess, but you know, I would thought I would have hurt it. So I asked uh, my friend for the for the paddle, and so I could have it. 